Hello everyone, my name is Jenny and I'm the Marketing Coordinator here at CYBS and like, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today. For those of you who don't know us, uh, the Kinney Youth Business Foundation is a national not-for-profit not organization dedicated to helping young entrepreneurs 18 to 39 start their businesses. Today's webinar is brought to you by Marion and O, you'll see her on the screen there, on understanding commercial leasing. Before we get started, I wanted to just go over a few housekeeping rules. Uh, I mentioned this before, that this presentation will be recorded for future use. Uh, it'll be found on our website, and I'll be taking questions at the end of the presentation, so please message me on the chat and I will collect them for the end. Uh, you'll also be able to take your own notes throughout the presentation under the Notes tab on the top right side of your screen. So again, if there are any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to ask me. Uh, uh, my name is under Canadian Youth Business Foundation through the chat box. So let me tell you a little bit about our webinar leader today. Marion Anel is the founder and president of Connect Legal. Marion began her career as a corporate lawyer in Toronto at McCarthy Trotteau and in New York at Simpson Thatcher and Barlett, and Kirkland and Ellis. Marion also provided pro bono services to clients that volunteer lawyers for the arts. She then left the private practice to become Vice President of Strategic Development for New Leaders for New Schools, a nonprofit organization seeking to improve the performance of failing public schools in the United States. Marion serves on the Board of Directors Board of Advisors of the George Brown College Institute of Entrepreneurship and Community Innovation. Marion also teaches business law at Centennial College in addition to many workshops she conducts for the Connect Legal Company. Now without further ado, I'll hand it over to Marion. Thanks Jenny and thanks so much for inviting me to host this webinar. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to hopefully uh, provide some useful tips to people just launching businesses, which is what I like to do best. Um, as Jenny mentioned in the introduction, I'm the founder of Connect Legal. So Connect Legal is a registered charity. We're a free legal services clinic. Um, but in many ways, founding a charity is similar, I think, to founding a business. And so I hope that some of the experiences I went through as the founder of this organization help me relate better to my uh, people that I'm talking to in my workshops. And some of our experiences will be quite similar, not the least of which was figuring out our office space. So I'll try to talk a little bit more about that as we, as we go along. Um, we were incorporated in late 2009 and operations launched in March 2010. And I'll just tell you uh, a couple of things about us. We are an independent legal clinic that helps low-resource immigrant entrepreneurs tackle the complexities of the Canadian commercial legal system. So our primary focus is to help people who are unfamiliar with the legal system understand some of the basic parameters. We do this through workshops like this one where we're talking in this case about a particular issue, commercial leases. Uh, which affects almost all businesses, but we also um, have workshops on other areas and a general business law workshop. Um, we also have, importantly, a free lawyer matching program where an individual small business owner can get legal advice from his or her own lawyer for free on a particular matter. But in order to qualify for that program, you need to fill out an application and um, the eligibility guidelines are um, important to comply with. Uh, since March of 2010, um, our programs have helped over 700 small businesses understand the legal system and how it affects their business. So commercial leases is, uh, is something that is really one of the most important decisions that any business makes um, for a number of reasons, but not least of which is it's usually one of your most, if not your most important financial obligation. And so, you know, let's just say that it is one of the most important decisions that you'll make and you don't want to rush into it. You definitely want to do your research, be careful, get advice where you need it and understand what you're getting into. Um, because if you do it right, it will save you money and effort and allow your business to flourish. 
And if you uh, don't do it right, it can be a costly mistake. Understand that this seminar is not going to provide you specifically with legal advice because, of course, lawyers always com combine the law with your particular fact situation um, to give you advice. And in the context of a seminar or a workshop, what I can do is tell you in general about the law, and hopefully that will give a guideline to you um, as to when you should seek legal advice and some of the things to be aware of. So obviously we do recommend legal advice before you sign a lease. So just to talk again about getting started, since I believe many of you are in that initial phase, um, flexibility is one of the most important things that you have. And of course, uh, reserving your cash is also an important consideration. And both of these things kind of come together when you think about entering into a lease, which is a relatively long-term commitment. So before we even get there, I think it's important to think about some alternatives um, to actually getting into a formal lease. Many of us start our businesses from our home on a laptop and we try to do a lot of our initial research, market research, initial contact with customers from home. Why? Because it's cheap. So obviously you can't run all businesses from your home and there's a lot of uh, zoning regulations or and or things to do with renting an apartment or a condo, owning a condo that affect what sort of business you can conduct in your home. But to the extent you can start out there, that's obviously a great alternative and one you don't want to uh, be hasty giving up. Um, another option that you may or not, may not be aware of is renting a desk. Um, there are a number of organizations in the city, both profit and nonprofit, where you can just rent what they call a hot desk. And that's something you should definitely uh, think about. Uh, also, the City of Toronto has meeting spaces which they'll make available to small business owners. And so I urge you to kind of do some initial research into you know, when do I really need a physical space? I mean, one of the things uh, we did here um, is we were talking to everyone in the, in sort of our industry, uh, that is the nonprofit industry in similar fields, and we garnered a lot of support and goodwill. Um, in your case, it would be with your customers. In our case, it was kind of within our network. And we ended up having a desk made available to us with a with an organization, the Maytree Foundation. And actually, what it did for us is not only did it give us a desk, which was really important, and somewhere to meet people, but the unintended consequence that we hadn't even sort of thought about initially was the incredible value of being around a group of people doing interesting things. And so, of course, it's for a lot of us, it's more fun to be around other people building things. So maybe there's companies where you can get in in a, in a way like that, it's, or maybe one of your most important clients would give you a desk to help get you started. Um, so it gives you really valuable information and, of course, a cheap space. And obviously, sharing an office with someone else is also a consideration, although, um, you know, obviously written agreements and things like that are important there. If you're selling goods in a retail scenario, do you really need a, a storefront or can you do it through a stall, be part of a bazaar? Of course, there's always the alternative of selling online over the Internet, which is obviously eliminates a lot of overhead. And then, of course, selling through an agent or on consignment. So all of these are kind of options. It's not that you, I don't want you to get a commercial lease, but I only want you to rent space when you're really able to afford it. And you really, um, in the early stages, may not have a predictable cash flow. And that can cause some issues, which we'll talk about as we, as we go on. Um, Another thing, and I'll just point out from our own personal experience, is because our needs kept changing in terms of space, we knew we'd move a few times in the first three years, and I think we actually probably moved three or four times. We didn't want to have to keep printing our promotional materials like business cards, brochures. So what we did was we just rented a P.O. box, and that's the address we printed. That doesn't work for everybody, but it worked for us, and it's meant we've consistently had the same address throughout for important mail and things like that. So before you, um, you obviously have to do research like any important business uh, decision. And so what you're going to be looking at is understanding your cash flow and what you can afford. Uh, where do you want to be located? Obviously think about your customers. Um, and 
think about um, a list of questions that you want to talk to landlords about. And sometimes it's good to have an initial meeting with a space you're not that excited about just to kind of start the learning process and start figuring out the kinds of things. Because every conversation you have, the landlord might volunteer slightly different information. And so you're compiling a list of all the things you care about. Um, it's really important to understand in this contract, just like any important business contract, it's really important to understand who's on the other side of the table. So who are you doing business with? Because, of course, if your landlord isn't financially sound, that could be your potential problem. If your landlord um, has plans for that space, uh, for example, is trying to sell the building, that's something you need to know right away. And so you really need to investigate who you're getting into this important business relationship with. Obviously, you need to review the lease, the building plans, and any other documentation that's going to help you in the negotiation process. So obviously, you think customers first. Uh, is the location going to be convenient for them? Is there parking? Is there public transit? Uh, is, it, is that accessible? Uh, can you put up signs that will guide customers to your door, or are there restrictions on that? Who are the neighboring businesses? Obviously, this is critically important. Are they complementary, or are they competitors? You can ask for non-competition clauses if you're in a, a sort of a collective space like a mall, and this is something you really need to focus on. Who's going to be your neighbor? If you're opening a cafe, how many cafes are going to be in this little space, that, in this little area around you? So you can ask for protection, and you should. And the other thing you need to think about, and again, this kind of goes to how well the landlord is doing, how are the other businesses doing in that, uh, let's call it a strip mall? Because if those businesses start to go under, that's going to affect your business. And so you need to figure out who you're getting into, uh, you know, who's going to be in your community and how that's going to affect you. Again, I talked a little bit at the beginning about maintaining flexibility, and I want to emphasize this, and then we'll talk a little bit more now about how you do that sort of from a contractual standpoint. Obviously, understand your needs may be changing, and so you, you need to, you have, you need certain options if your business grows, and you need different options if your business shrinks or change care, changes its character. Um, so again, think about the cash flow, uh, think about the tax, uh, you know, so you want to think about that what the real cost is, not just the rent. Um, and so what, what are they going to be the tax costs uh, or benefit to you of renting or versus buying or uh, other arrangements? Um, if your business is going to pivot, um, is that going to affect the lease? So, for example, you might want to have something in there that says the tenant may use and occupy the premises for all lawful purposes as opposed to the tenant may occupy the premises to run a coffee shop. So that kind of thing can be very important at the initial stages. And obviously the length of term of the lease um, is critical. So again, if you have a shorter uh, lease with the right to renew, that really works best in your benefit. Um, if you just get a one-year lease and no right to renew, you may be moving just when your business takes off. So that's a problem. So think about that issue. Um, So remember, uh, just like any contract, verbal contracts can count. Um, and although there are certain rules about contracts needing to be in writing, um, you know, all kinds of agreements can be contracts, whether they're verbal, email, in writing, or whatever. So keep that in mind. The other thing that you need to keep in mind at the general level, most of us experience leases primarily as uh, residential leases. So, you know, everybody has lived in an apartment at some point and they've had a residential lease. And it's important to understand that the government has put in, through the laws, a lot of protections for residential tenants. So the protections that you enjoy, most of the, this has just seeped into our awareness that we can't be thrown out on the street in January. A lot of these uh, protections have been put in legally to protect individuals renting homes. These protections do not apply in the context of a commercial lease, and that can really uh, confuse people. So you think you have certain protections because you have them in your home apartment, but you in fact don't. And so I want to make that point. The law considers this as two businesses coming together, the landlord with its renting business and you with your whatever your business is. 
and doesn't really see the need to get involved and protect you, okay? So just assume you need to negotiate everything. You need to protect yourself. Um, usually a lease is put in front of you from your landlord. It's unusual for the tenant to draft the lease. So what does that tell you? The landlord probably, and especially if it's a bigger landlord with a lot of uh, rental spaces, has thought a lot about this lease, has probably got professional help, and obviously has put the lease to favor the landlord, not you. And there may be what we think of as gotcha clauses in there, so you need to look at it carefully. Um, and um, the other thing to note is that if your lease expires, do not assume that your rights continue. So you kind of continue on a month to month. If you pay your rent for January, then okay, you have struck some kind of a deal with the landlord for January, but this is not the same as renewing your lease. And many leases actually will say in them that the lease must be renewed in writing. So once you're out of that period, whatever protections you negotiated for yourself initially are vulnerable. So you can't treat it as something, you know, that you can just assume is going to carry on. Um, so again, recognize that if you're negotiating with your landlord's agent, the agent's uh, incentive is to close the deal. And so, you know, just like anything, they tell you, oh, don't worry, we'll work this out, we'll work that out. Like any contract, if it's not in writing, it probably doesn't count. Uh, it might count or it just might not count at all. And so it's just not a good idea to rely on anything verbal in this, in this context. Um, so obviously, um, don't be afraid to negotiate. Ask for whatever concessions you think you might need. And um, obviously, consult a lawyer if you feel you need one. So understand that if you sign a letter of intent to rent a space, the letter of intent is often binding. So even though it's not an actual lease, it's still a binding contract and you may not be able to get out of it or you may be, you may have to forfeit a deposit. Um, so only sign a binding document like that when you're ready to do it because sometimes a better space becomes available after you've started negotiating with one landlord, then you find out about another space. So you may want to at that stage include an option to cancel the letter of intent. Um, and you really need to be careful about units that are under construction when you're looking at them because this is one of the most common problems. The landlord says, this space will be ready on May 1st for you to move in. Okay, so what happens if it's not ready on May 1st? Well, what happens depends on your deal, and this depends on what you've negotiated. So maybe you negotiated, okay, it's not ready, but I don't have to pay the rent starting on May 1st. That might seem like an okay deal to you, but what does that mean? You can't start your business now for an extra two months. Maybe you have customers you need to serve, and all of a sudden you can't move into your space. So it's not good enough that you're not paying rent. You actually need a space. Um, and so maybe you want to get out of the lease and, and go immediately somewhere else. And maybe you even want to negotiate some kind of penalty for the landlord. So these are all things you really have to think about in advance. Um, so if you are renovating your space, um, again, it may not be, you know, you're improving the space, which the landlord may enjoy the benefits of going forward. So maybe you can negotiate the rent for that period of time. Um, and remember, uh, and this is important to remember, that if you are attaching things to the space, those uh, things, they're called fixtures, and they often become the property of the commercial landlord. So if you're screwing in counter, uh, you know, uh, cashier, cash register counters and things like that, attaching them physically to the premises, you probably don't own them when you leave. The landlord owns them. So again, this is something you can negotiate, but it's very important to be aware of when you're improving a space. Um, okay. Let's talk about the true cost of the space. It's not just the rent. It's obviously uh, could include utilities. Oftentimes, commercial landlords make you get insurance. Um, so there may be a mandatory insurance cost, and it's important to understand that GST, if parking is something you have to have, then you have to pay for it. Um, a security deposit, any charges for common areas in the building, any promotion or other administrative fees. So all of these things could be buried in your lease, and you need to look for them. 
um, any kind of general maintenance and repair pro of, of property um, other than structural elements of the building. So look for all of these things in your lease and um, make sure you understand them and you understand how and when they might be increased. Always think about your exit strategy, right? You need to know how to get in. You need to know how much it's going to cost you to get out. Like with anything, and by the way, this would apply obviously to equipment leasing as well. Um, again, you know, what if your business is shrinking and your needs are changing? What are you going to do? So there are these things called acceleration clauses in leases and in equipment leases. What happens is if you're in default um, or if something happens, there is an acceleration clause, which means the entire money owing to the landlord suddenly becomes due. So if there's an acceleration that happens in the third month of a 12-month lease, all of a sudden you owe 12 months rent right now. So obviously you don't want that kind of clause in your lease. Um, what about cancellation? Can you negotiate going in some kind of cancellation rights that limit your personal liability or your, or your company's liability? And I just want to add at this point that oftentimes landlords will ask for personal guarantees, particularly with new businesses. They're doing that because they want to obviously increase uh, your, um, the pressure on you to make payments. If you've just incorporated a business, the landlord doesn't have much confidence in the track record of that business. And so he or she might obviously ask for a personal guarantee. It's not an unreasonable request, but you never want to give one unless you absolutely have to. If you do have to give a personal guarantee, you should try to negotiate when that personal guarantee will fall away. So for example, if I pay all of my rent for this period of time, with no problems, after one year, the personal guarantee automatically terminates. It's much easier to have something arranged in advance than to have to go back a year later when you're already invested in that space. Maybe you've painted it, you've made some improvements, your customers are used to it, and now you're saying, hey, actually, I've been a good tenant, I want to get rid of this personal guarantee. Well, you know, why not just have that conversation up front? Um, and obviously, I'd urge you to sign the lease uh, not personally, but in the name of your new company. Um, and limit your liability in the event that you breach the lease. So if you suddenly decide to move out, maybe you can negotiate that you only owe three months rent. So these are the kinds of things um, that it's easier to deal with up front, and you can compare it across a couple of different spaces you're looking at. It's important to understand assignments and subletting because these are different legal concepts that can affect you. So we started off at the beginning, we said, well, maybe you can get a sublet of space from an existing business that has a complementary customer base um, for you. What does it mean when you sublet? It means that you're coming, there is a re primary relationship between the landlord and the tenant, and you as a subletter are coming in subordinate to that relationship. So that means that if you if you go and sublet space from another business, whatever it is that they negotiated with the landlord affects you too. So if they didn't do a good job negotiating, then you didn't get the protections. Of course, you may like it because you may have an informal month-to-month -month arrangement that makes you feel like you have some flexibility. But just be aware of that. So similarly, there's a big difference to you in getting the right from your landlord to sublet or assign. So if I want maximum flexibility that if the space doesn't work out for me, I can get out of there, I can do stuff like, well, I can leave with a penalty of three months, or I can, I have the right to assign. Um, now, usually landlords won't give you a blanket right to assign the lease to somebody else. In other words, you replace yourself and you walk away. They usually don't do that. Sometimes, though, they might allow you to assign with their consent and sometimes with their consent not to be unreasonably withheld. So they just want the right to look at the credit and things like that and the suitability of the tenant you're suggesting as a replacement. A lesser right would be the ability to sublet. So in this case, you still maintain primary, primary responsibility to your landlord, but at least you can share the space if it's turning out that you need to share costs. And again, it could be the right to sublet or the right to sublet with consent not to be unreasonably withheld, et cetera. So these are all sort of areas of negotiation, but they're good things to have. They're very valuable. Um, 
and it gives you that kind of flexibility that you want if your business doesn't grow as quickly as you wanted it to. So when can your landlord terminate the lease and kick you out? Well, we all kind of assume that if we don't pay our rent, the landlord can kick you out. But actually, there's other things um, that can happen to you. And you, again, some of this goes to knowing your landlord and understanding your landlord's um, agenda, but you won't necessarily always know that. So you need to protect yourself in the lease. And the most obvious one is redevelopment. If your landlord wants to renovate or redevelop the space, he or she has an incentive to kick you out or get rid of you, uh, possibly. I mean, you don't know, but obviously if they're redeveloping a piece of property, you've got to get out. And they may have put in the lease that they can just tell you to get out with a couple of months uh, notice. And that's very bad for you. So, you know, if that's really important, I mean, have this conversation with the landlord because if it's really important to the landlord, they should be willing to maybe help you relocate. And uh, again, if you don't ask, you're not going to get those kind of protections. Um, the other thing, though, to be aware of, of course, if the landlord has an objective like that, things that may seem relatively minor to you could suddenly become grounds for eviction if that's what it says in the lease. So, for example, you know, you said you were going to be running a coffee shop in this space, but the coffee shop didn't work out, and now you're running a um, a bakery. And this has been going on for months, and there's nothing in writing, but no one seems to have complained about it. All of a sudden, you're in violation of the clause that says you can only run a coffee shop. Well, why does the landlord suddenly care? Maybe the landlord has some other uh, some other objective here and wants to terminate the lease, and this is what they're using. So, you know, also subletting without consent. Everybody may know it may seem like things are fine, and then all of a sudden they're not fine. So that's why it's important to have these protections in writing. Um, if you didn't negotiate it in the initial lease, though, you can still try to get it at some point. Um, and you want to know uh, whether this is something the landlord is going to object to. And if they don't object today, that doesn't mean they won't object in six months. So again, you got to get that in writing. Um, so again, you know, obviously non-payment of rent is a problem. And it's not like a residential lease where it can take the landlord months kick you out because you don't have the protections of a residential tenant. So be aware of that and understand that it's extremely important. Um, and normally they, uh, you know, obviously there's going to be some kind of notification. So if your check just kind of got lost in the mail, uh, they need to let you know that you haven't paid them. But um, you need to you need to pay up or the landlord does have a lot of rights to change locks, seize property, etc. Now, um, if you are in a dispute with your landlord, um, I just want to emphasize, again, that it's important to document the dispute. So just as I said earlier, if the landlord is giving you concessions on your lease, like, oh, yeah, sure, we don't care if you sublet, get it in writing. Get some kind of documentary evidence that, you know, effectively a provision of the lease has been waived. There's most likely, it may not be there, but often there's a provision in the lease that will say all amendments to this lease must be in writing. It may say in writing and signed by both parties, executed by both parties, which means it's got to have a, you know, if it says it needs a signature, it needs a signature. So um, just saying, well, the landlord told me it was okay. I mean, it's not a very, uh, it's not a very stable position for you as a tenant. Obviously, get legal advice and get it as quickly as possible because, again, something like this is very destabilizing to your business and not to be taken lightly. And here are the procedures uh, with disputes over uh, commercial leases, either the small claims court, which is up to $25,000, or the superior court of justice. Um, the small claims court, by the way, is geared to be a little bit more user-friendly than the regular court system. And many of the forms um, that you think about, you fill out to go to court, like statement of claim, statement of defense, things like that, a lot of the forms are on the internet. If you just Google Small Claims Court Ontario, you'll find a lot of information about how the court works. Um, because again, it is an attempt to make it a little bit more user-friendly than the regular court system. Having said that, obviously going to court is not a good option for a growing business for all the obvious reasons. And um, with a well-negotiated lease, the idea is that you would stay out of court. 
So I want to just take a little bit more time to talk to you about our free lawyer matching program to the extent that some of you may be eligible. What we do, as I mentioned earlier, is we pair you up with a volunteer lawyer. Um, so in this case, for example, if you're considering signing a commercial lease and you qualify for our program, a lawyer will sit down with you and go through the lease with you and explain to you what some of those clauses mean to you and give you a heads up. Obviously, lawyers have seen a lot of commercial leases and they've seen what can go wrong in commercial leases and so they can give you some good advice about what to watch out for. But we also have a more, uh, it's not just about commercial leases, we provide um, standard form contracts to be used with your customers, helping understanding licensing and permitting requirements for your business. And you know, all legal matters related to the growth of a small business. We do not, by the way, uh, help with insolvency matters or litigation matters. The eligibility criteria for that program is that you must be an immigrant legally in Canada. You must be running or imminently starting a viable business, so starting something now, uh, not something you're just thinking about getting into. And you have to be unable to afford a lawyer. You can complete an application for that program online uh, at our website and you can find out more about Connect Legal there. We also uh, try to compile legally helpful resources for small business owners, so I urge you to check that out. Um, if you don't qualify for our program and you're looking for legal advice, the Law Society of Upper Canada, which is the Ontario governing, uh, governing organization for lawyers in Ontario, has a referral service, and I've given you the contact information there. What you do is call them, say, I need a lawyer experienced in commercial leases in the downtown core, for example, and they'll give you three numbers, and you can call those lawyers and see if you want to use one of those lawyers. Anytime you're working with a lawyer, you need to understand that, you know, whereas when a business person deals with a client, you'll just keep talking and talking and talking to that client until you close the deal. With a lawyer, you want to talk as little as possible because they're billing you and usually by the tenth of the hour. And oftentimes, the lawyer has to do research as well. So if we have a half hour conversation and I go to the law library to research it, you paid for the half hour call, you might have paid for 10 minutes of my prep time before the call so I know what we're going to be talking about. And then you're going to have to pay while I go and do some research if it's a particularly, you know, scenario of law where research is required. So it's good to understand going in with a lawyer, um, you know, how much is involved and what's, what's the range that you think this might cost me, and to always be highly prepared, knowing what it is you want to get out of the meeting, having all your documents ready to go, and managing the process to eliminate, um, you know, wasting time in the meeting while you're shuffling through papers. So you can find out more about us and you can get in touch with our organization, which again is a registered charity. Um, at info at connectlegal.ca and you can also take a look at our, um, you can call us. Um, and we've also given you here a couple of uh, sources of information that we think are really helpful. In particular, the Ontario government has a frequently asked questions about commercial leases and I actually find this really helpful. It's all the questions that people tend to ask. Um, I didn't pay my rent, what does that mean? My landlord hasn't fixed the plumbing. What does that mean? These are the kinds of questions in there. So it's really good to take a look at, especially before you go out and start having those conversations with landlords. And um, also the uh, another uh, uh, another page that's also quite helpful that we found. So we direct you to those two for further questions. So thanks very much for listening. And I'm happy to take some questions if anyone has any questions. All right, we do have uh, quite a few questions that came through today, so I'll just get started. Um, the first question is, do you advise to see a commercial agent or do you recommend speaking directly to the landlord? So, um, as I understand the question, seeing a commercial agent, unclear to me whether you mean that the person looking to rent uh, is going to get an agent or whether the landlord has an agent. So I'll just sort of take a look at it overall. Uh, a lot of landlords will have agents and obviously they want their agents to deal with you, the customer. Um, and I guess I talked a little bit earlier about it. I mean, the kind of conversations you sometimes have with agents is, well, what's the cost per square foot? Well, we don't really, we don't really use that 
matrix that you know measurement uh, unit in this office building that's not the way we operate well i mean obviously anyone can figure out cost per square foot and they should be you know prepared to uh, answer questions like that um so just remember they're acting for the landlord not you um and i think uh I guess, you know, look, what I would really advise is a variety of everything because if you can talk to landlords, um, it depends. I mean, you, you know, the, the people I'm talking to right now are all business people. So they theoretically need to either they are or they need to be good at negotiating deals. And a commercial lease is a deal and it's an extremely important deal to your business. And so, you know, who's going to be the best advocate for your business? Oftentimes, it's hopefully going to be you. And uh, so I wouldn't say don't use an agent, of course. But if you are using an agent, you need to be guiding that agent and making sure that agent is representing you because they do have experience and they do know what they're doing. And so you want them to be representing you to the best of their capabilities. And just like anything, in order for someone to represent you well, they need to be highly informed and they need to understand that you know what you're doing and that you expect the best from them. So that would be my advice on that. Okay, perfect. And uh, so the second question is, um, I, you mentioned the time frame of a lease. So a question came through is, what is the right time frame to stay in a location? Yeah, okay, so again, tricky question because it all depends. Um, if you grow quickly, you're going to grow your space. And it's really interesting. I have to say, I've seen everything. I've seen everything here. I've seen people take too much space and then have to, and that's when that subletting uh, clause becomes very important. Um, I've seen people, which is more fun, honestly, is to see where you had a kitchen and now you've got three people crammed in because you're a technology startup. I mean, we saw a lot of this in the in the late 90s, um, all of a sudden, you know, people are working on the top of the mini fridge because there's no more desk space for them, and that's a good problem to have. Um, but every time you move, you know, it's not just the cost of the movers and the et cetera, but there's a huge cost in terms of, you know, production kind of comes to a halt for whatever length of time, and maybe you're changing phone numbers, you're changing mailing address, it's confusing and chaotic. So my advice on that one is that's why I like this idea of, you know, some kind of a mailbox, which isn't necessarily tied into a physical space right at that beginning phase where you really, it's hard to project what your growth trajectory is going to be because the less disruption, the better. So, um, you know, there was the summer where I had to work from home because I'd given up my desk to, uh, to somebody for the summer and I was trying to talk to another uh, nonprofit on the phone and she she apologized the third time she hung up on me. She said, I'm running my office out of a coffee shop because I've given my desk up. I said, I've given my desk up. So it's a good problem to have, but it's, um, it's different for everybody. Okay, that's fair. Uh, the second question is, what protections are we not getting in a commercial lease that we could be affected by that we, um, this was in regards to your uh, your comment yeah. about in residential leasing, you have, well, by, you are protected? Yeah, well, by far the most important one is this issue of um, getting kicked out, right? So mm -hmm. we've all seen, and I actually remember uh, reading on the front page of a newspaper about a year ago, um, a famous case of somebody who was, you know, a residential landlord's nightmare of someone they can never get rid of and it's there's a whole procedure that residential landlords need to to go through to kick somebody out of their apartment and you know most of us are kind of used to this idea that you know if the rent is it's many hours late or uh, you know it's just not that easy to to get somebody out of an apartment and they have a lot of opportunities to show up and pay up and make the problem go away before they actually have the locks changed on them. And so most of us have that in the back of our mind. Um, and and that is like the most fundamental one where you just don't have that sort of protection. And a lot of things flow through that. I mean, you know, when you're in the space and it's residential and you don't renew the lease, it means one thing. It's commercial and you don't renew the lease, it means something else. 
um, and, and you know fixtures. I mean, there are a number of there are a number of issues around this, and and I think the point that you need to keep in mind is, you know, you are now operating as a business, not as a uh, you know, as not as a, a person who needs a roof over their head to survive, right? So, so it's just not an area where you can, for example, there's a standard form lease um, with residential tenancies, and there isn't one in commercial. It's what you know what the landlord says it is. So, just the important point is not to assume protection. You know, you make sure that anything that's important to you is in black and white in writing in your lease. And you don't assume that, oh, I forgot, but it's okay because I'm sure there's some law out there that will protect me. Fair enough. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay. So the, another question is, are there big differences for commercial leasing in different provinces? Well, you know, I don't know about big differences. I mean, I guess that depends on your definition. I mean, you know, the thing about asking lawyers is lawyers are admitted to practice in a particular province. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, in my case, Ontario. Um, so to me, it makes all the difference in the world as a professional. Um, you know, so if it's a if BC lease, you want a BC lawyer looking at it. Um, but I mean, obviously, the overall concepts are the same, and you know, an overall concept of kind of buyer beware. Uh, in other words, resident, uh, commercial tenant, you know, take look after yourself. I mean, that's the fundamental here because a contract, you know, the the, the fun thing about a contract is that it's what you make of it. So if you are a good negotiator, you will negotiate a good contract, and in that sense having the freedom to contract, you know, to, to get your own particular lease that addresses your particular issue is a good thing. Um, and so the more freedom you have to do that, you know, that, that's not necessarily bad. But um, it all comes down to being uh, aware, getting advice when you need it, and, um, and uh, you know, doing your research and your homework. Okay, perfect. Okay, so we still have a few more uh, questions. Uh, another one is, if what if the landlord doesn't have a draft commercial lease? Is there a website that you can recommend to find these draft leases, or is there a, a template online somewhere? Yeah. You know, I get this question a lot, um, not just about commercial leases, but people ask me, um, where can I get a contract on the Internet? Uh, and, um, you know, the thing again about contracts is each contract is theoretically unique, and I know that's an annoying answer, but 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 it's sort of true. Um, and so lawyers in general try not to make a contract. You know, they don't want to just put contracts out there because what might work for you might not work for uh, somebody else on the call. Um, and that's where you know you you pay for the advice. But um, the most obvious location. The way you know the way that um, the the best way to sort of look at a contract is by comparing it to another contract. I mean that's always worked for me, right? So my advice would be so the first answer is um, I don't have an easy reference to what a commercial contract should look like, but uh, you can certainly get contracts from uh, landlords if you're looking at their space or if you have friends who have space and most people have at least a couple of friends who can get their hands on a contract and if you look through them you know they're going to follow a fairly standard format um, in terms of what's where and you will see how different things get treated so if you sit down for an afternoon and you're you're kind of comparing you're going to see well that's interesting you know what's this acceleration clause thing uh, because I don't see it over here or you know okay, if I don't pay my rent here, then the landlord has to go through the following steps. But on this lease, it doesn't say anything like that. It, you know, it seems much less, um, you know, the notice requirements are much less. And the way you're going to figure that out is by comparing and contrasting and negotiating with different landlords. So the point is don't take the first one that comes along. Try to get, try to do a little research in advance. And again, the websites that I mentioned here on this slide definitely highlight some of the key points that you want to be thinking about negotiating. 
Okay, great. So we have a, another question. If a landlord indicates that they want a percentage of your profit, can you say no? I guess that's part of negotiation. Yeah, yeah, you can always say no. Um, and I got to tell you, that one wouldn't be my favorite one to say yes to, that's for sure. Um, the question I have right away is, okay, so if I'm losing money, are you going to take a percent of my losses? <laughs> But, you know, what you want to think about, though, that is is kind of along these lines is can you negotiate rent that goes up and down? So, for example, if you have a seasonal business and you know that your profits are higher in the summer significantly, you know, is there a way you can figure this out with the landlord? So, for example, um, you – why do you have to pay the same amount of rent every month of the year? It's just because that's the deal you struck, right? So if that doesn't make sense for your business, this comes back to this cash flow issue um, of always understanding your cash flow. You know, um, you will have cash going out of your business, and one of the big chunks of change is going to be this lease. And, if you know, you're saying here, the, the example is the landlord saying, well, give me a percentage of your profits. You know, and of course, my answer is, well, then take a percentage of my losses. That's the natural counter. But you don't have to put it that way. You can say, look, I know I'm going to be making more business June, July, and August. So why don't I pay you a little bit more in those months? And I know it's going to be harder for me to make my rent in January, February, March. So why don't we just negotiate up front that the, the, that the rent in those months will be lower? So I think just by having that conversation, you're going to learn something. Okay, perfect. And is it better to hire someone to negotiate your lease rather than negotiate yourself prior to having a lawyer review the final contract? Um, I don't know. That's a tough one. I mean, it, it all depends on who we're talking about. I mean, you know, if you get – all I can say is if you have a lawyer who's who's done a lot of commercial leases, um, you know, in my opinion, uh, you can get some very worthwhile advice. Uh, from a lawyer, but I also think it's important to understand that, you know, I always come back to this, don't ever turn over um, responsibility for a negotiation to somebody who's not you, right? I mean, you are the founder of your business, and you know what counts. I mean, the way I see issues being problematic is, you know, sometimes you're dealing in an area where you don't have the expertise, and I mean, it happens all the time. When you're buying computer systems for your business and you're not a computer expert, you call a company who's theoretically an expert at selling computers to businesses and you rely on them to tell you what you need. And what you find is a lot of the time they know they are computer experts, but they're not experts in your business. And you're an expert in your business, but you're not a computer expert. And there's so much room there for misunderstanding and ending up with stuff that doesn't work for you. And the only way to avoid it is to keep having conversations keep asking questions, do your homework. And it's the same thing with anything. And this is just one more example. So, you know, if you can, um, you know, have six people negotiate your, your lease, you're going to think of, a, a, you know, more things than if you have one person negotiate it. But, you know, it, of course, you can't throw six people in front of your landlord. So it's always a balancing act and it's always an information gathering act. And it's never something where you take your hands off the steering wheel. Fair enough. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, another question is, is it very common to ask for free rent when doing leasehold improvements? And how is the best way to approach the landlord on this? Okay, so free rent does happen. It does happen. Um, and so it's absolutely, I mean, you know, it's always, like, again, with these questions, you know, you should never be afraid to ask for anything because the worst that happens is the person says no. Now, obviously, how you ask for it can be uh, important. So obviously in that case, you say, look, um, I think I'm really improving your building and I think that's worth money to you. So again, this goes back to negotiating who gets these improvements at the end of the day. Because if you're doing something that's going to stay with that physical space, obviously that's more attractive to the landlord than, oh, and by the way, when I leave, I'm ripping everything out and the floor is going to be a mess and I'm taking it all with me. And that's what I want negotiated in my lease. So, you know, it kind of, again, all depends on the circumstances, but I think um, the important point is to open the dialogue and 
in so doing, you will understand more about what's important to your landlord. I mean, maybe that's even a way to broach it is, you know, what can I do to provide value? Um, you're beginning a relationship and a very important relationship. And who knows how this landlord and this relationship can be helpful to you. And the best way to find out is to have that conversation. And, to, and you know, I always think you're better off having more than one conversation with more than one person because, you know, you always are, you feel more confident and you feel like you have more leverage when you're negotiating in a couple of different uh, spaces. And, uh, you know, obviously, again, you can't start signing letters of intent and things like that, but you can certainly have a couple of conversations and get information from different sources. That's great. Okay, on to the next question. When finding space in an area that is considered a hot commodity, like most areas in Vancouver, how mm -hmm. can a small and new business owner compete with larger and more established businesses? That's a tough one. That's a tough one. Um, it's really hard. Um, why is it really hard? Because you don't have a proven track record of your ability to pay rent, and an established business does. You don't have collateral behind you, uh, and an established business may. Um, you may or may not bring value to that location for the other, you know, in the case of a mall, for the other occupants in the mall. If you suddenly, you know, have a lineup outside your door, that's good for all the other businesses, you know, that are complementary as well. Um, these are the things you're not bringing to the table. Um, and there's, these are hard business, I mean, these are not legal issues, you know, these are, this is the, the tricky part about being a new business, it's the tricky part with anything. So, um, you need to sell, 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 right? You need to really believe in what you're doing. And this isn't just with your landlord, obviously, but you need to convince. That's really the only, uh, one of the most important counterpoints to this is, I know I can make this work. And I can convince other people that I can make it work. And one of those people is my future landlord. Um, and think about it from the landlord's perspective. You know, what's valuable to the landlord? I mean, I just mentioned a few things, right? Those are the, you know, some of the things that are valuable. And so you talk in those terms. You know, if you put a cell phone repair shop next to the coffee shop while and, and the photography shop, you know, while people are getting their, their cell phone fixed, maybe they'll walk next door and get a coffee. Maybe they'll go to the bookstore around the corner. You know, you talk in terms that are going to appeal. And in order to do that, you need to understand what appeals to your landlords. I mean, maybe they want short-term leases, so that's perfect if that's what you want. You know, so again, Dialogue is my advice. Okay, great. So we have two more questions here. Uh, second to last is, if the landlord doesn't have a written lease to present and he has the tenant to have, to, the tenant to draw one up and the law, landlord will review it, who will bear the legal cost? Um, well, usually, and of course you can, again, you can negotiate anything. Usually, though, in just common parlance, if I say I'm going to be responsible for presenting a contract, then I've got to cough up a contract, whether it's by hiring a lawyer or by writing my own contract. Uh, you know, either way, uh, I would think that the cost is on me. I mean, that's kind of the general, you know, uh, nature of that kind of conversation, but it certainly doesn't mean you can't say, you know, but but if you think about it, why would the landlord give you money to hire a lawyer for you who's going to write the contract, right? So um, that would be my understanding of it, is that you bear the cost okay. in most cases. Okay. Sometimes, though, you do negotiate that. Okay, perfect. And so, sorry, there's another, there's two more questions now, sorry. So can you make changes and renegotiate a lease partway through your lease? Yeah, once again, uh, the beauty of contracts is you can, you can, sure, um, and people do. Um, so I guess the question, I'm trying to think here broader term, uh, why would you do that? Um, so obviously you might do it because you're growing and you want more space, which is a good thing, and the landlord 
theoretically would be happy. Um, but there may not be any contiguous space that may not actually work anyway, just for logistical reasons. Um, shrinking, they're not going to be so keen. So I guess the answer is, yeah, sure. But then, you know, what's in it for the landlord? So again, it goes back to my earlier slide about trying to put some flexibility in there um, to begin with. So for example, if you think you might grow faster than you think, you can put in a right of first refusal on any space in the building. So, you know, maybe you can negotiate that. I mean, all these things always cost something, right? But maybe you can say, hey, before you, you know, if somebody else is leaving, before you put it out in public, you give us the option, right? So that's one, one thing you can think about. Okay, perfect. Okay, and then the last question is just uh, for yourself. Just wondering, having said all of the things that you said today, is there any tips that you want to leave everyone with? Well, I think my overriding, I hope I'm not repeating myself, but my overriding uh, advice um, is to understand that this is one of the most important contracts your business is going to have at this stage. Uh, it's potentially a very long-term relationship, and it's really worth, um, first of all, waiting to the right stage of development for your business to lock yourself in. And that might be a little bit longer than you think um, because, you know, you think your business is going to grow at whatever speed. And, you know, oftentimes th things take a little bit longer. And the more money you can save by having the smaller space, great, right? Because every desk you're paying for that you don't need is a waste of your money. Um, so I guess my advice is to definitely wait until as late as you possibly can uh, to you really feel you're re ready for that commitment. And then do your homework on the physical space, like do your homework in terms of what it's going to mean for your business, just in terms of geography and, you know, what's there, what's around. And then do your homework in terms of what that lease should look like and what are the important criteria for you and get the advice you need. Because, you know, you just got to take this thing seriously because it's very important. And hopefully it's the beginning of a long and, and happy relationship with your landlord. Okay. And definitely get in touch with us if we can be of help. Okay, perfect. So thank you very much to everyone who joined us today. And uh, I'll just ask Marion to click it over to the last slide there. Uh, and a very special thank you to Marion for with all the great information and for answering all of our questions today. We really, really do appreciate it. Uh, again, if there are any questions, please feel free to email uh, myself or Marion directly. Uh, there are the info at emails. I think she can flip it one more slide. And uh, do follow us on Twitter. Oh, sorry. And then, it's okay. Do follow us <laughs> there on you Twitter go. Uh, and or Facebook. And if you have any updates or any questions on any future webinars, please feel free to message us there. And uh, we'll be happy to answer any of your questions afterwards. Again, I mentioned that the webinar will be archived. It will be saved on our Business Resource Center, and I will definitely email it to all of the registrants here today. So. Thanks again for your time, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye now.